okay we'll let us start uh, good morning uh, today uh, today we will have a, a discussion on uh, some surgical specimens we cannot finish up in one day so it will be uh, more like a uh, oski pattern we'll have just specific questions out of the specimen being shown uh, i request uh, our uh, pgts to participate uh, dr shobita chatterjee a professor of surgery at ipjm system hospital will uh, take us through this uh, specific scenario okay dr chatterjee you can please start yes sir um, who will be the first one to take the specimen um, is dr Hima, has dr himanshu logged in dr himanshu prasad Uh, uh, Dr. Ganesh will start. Okay. Yeah. Good morning, Ganesh. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, Ganesh, uh, we'll start with the first specimen. Okay. So, this is your specimen, right? Yes, you Take a good look at it. Um, I would particularly want you to take a good look at this area. Okay. This is a very obvious specimen. Not all of them will be so obvious to you. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Anish, are you ready? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, fine. Okay. So, uh, what is this a specimen of? Um, uh, stomach. <clears throat> is a stomach. Agreed. Why do you say this is the stomach? I could see the uh, lesser curvature, greater curvature, uh, plus the gastric foldings, everything I can see. What is a gastric folds? What are they called? We don't call it gastric folds. There's a term for it. What is it called? Something with an R? Rugae. Rugae or rugosities. Correct. Now see, this is a very obvious image where the shape of the stomach is obviously given. But you may not always get such a straightforward thing. You may get something like this also. So rugae is something you have to recognize. So going back to your image, yes, this is a specimen of stomach, which you can understand by the shape of the structure and you can obviously uh, interpret the ryugi which are visible more so along the greater curvature and less so what else do you see in this image what else do you see in this image this i could see a scarring kind of okay where do you see the scarring the distal region distal region of what be very specific with what you say in, in the Yes, Okay, so you can see a scarring. Are you talking about this? Oh, yes, no, just related to. Yeah, so you can see a scarring in the region of the antrum or you can see the region of the pylorus. What do you think this is? What do you think this is? What is your diagnosis? Yes, it is a stomach as identified by the shape and the rugosities and you can see a region of scarring in the antral region just adjacent to the pylorus. Uh, well, what maybe do you think? Ga uh, chronic gastric ulcer uh, with a okay. I think it is a chronic is okay why do you say it is a chronic gastric ulcer ma'am uh, this uh, scarring is quite uh, more common in chronic compared to the acute acute this much of scarring will not be okay so you are saying that because there is a scarring you feel it is a chronic gastric ulcer now, as opposed to this if i show you this image would you give the same diagnosis or would it be any different? Um, I'm not sure about this. Ma it may be acute because the surrounding areas are acutely inflamed. Yes, uh, so it is, a, it is more of a fresh specimen. It was immediately after it was taken out from surgery. So yes, the uh, area is inflamed, edematous. Uh, but what do you see at the center? In both the images, what do you see? Just the scarring or would you call it something else? What is this area? Um, uh, the folding towards the the rugosities are with. Uh, so will you not to... call it just? Will you not say it's a gastric ulcer? Yes or no? Um, this can be a gastric ulcer. This could be a gastric ulcer. Looking at the image, can you specify whether it is a benign gastric ulcer or a malignant gastric ulcer? Yes. Yes. What can you say? Um, uh, 
uh, I'm not able to tell properly. I mean, in case of a benign, the gastric fold will be oriented towards the ulcer. Uh, yes. Whereas in chronic, it is of different that protrusion. No, I'm kind talking of... about acute and chronic, mind you. I'm talking about benign versus malignant. Ah. Yes, yeah. I mean malignancy. The... What do you find? The... Um... So you hmm. see the rugosities are tapering towards the base of the ulcer. Okay, so yeah, what are the characteristics? They are normally situated more along the lesser curvature. They are clean cut ulcers like this, and you have the rugosities in converging towards the ulcer. As opposed to it, if it was a malignant ulcer, what would be the characteristics? From the border will be irregular. <laughs> uh, okay. Folds will not be converging towards the ulcer. So what happens to the folds? The rugosities are something which is characteristic of the stomach. Right. So what happens to the folds? They are altered. They are irregularly fashioned. And uh, they... Man. What is the classic description? What is the classic description? Yes. Mm -hmm. Here, rugosities are prominent. Yeah, look at this now. So these are the rugosities. But what happens in this area? A loss of rugosities. Loss of rugosities. So there is effacement. The word is effacement. effacement. There is effacement of the rugosities. If you compare this, see the, here the rugosities are converging right up to the ulcer. It's a clean cut ulcer. But if you look at this, you see there's effacement in this region. You do not find any uh, rugosities in the area of the ulcer. In benign, there will be rugosities right converging into the ulcer, whereas in malignant, there is effacement of the rugosities in the vicinity of the ulcer. Okay, we'll go back to our patient here. Uh, where are the common sites of a benign uh, ulcer, benign gastric ulcer? R rather, I would say a benign peptic ulcer. I will say a gastric ulcer. Where mm -hmm. all do you commonly find a benign peptic ulcer? D1 of duodenum, uh, okay. distal uh, gas, uh, pylorus and uh, antrum. So stomach is one, yes, antral region and the pylorus. D1, where else? <clears throat> Which part you said D1? Do we also get it in other parts of the duodenum? If um, so, under which we situation? will get in other parts of the duodenum, but it is not most. Uh, we will not be getting it pre frequently in case of some other syndromes like Zollinger Ellison syndrome. We may get in. But still, it's a peptic ulcer only. If it's in Zollinger Ellison, it's still a peptic ulcer only. It's still a peptic ulcer, yes. So, under Zollinger Ellison, where else do you get it? Where else do you get pepsin secreting cells? That is where the ulcers will form. Pepsin uh, found in the body of these two. Pepsin secretion. Yes, you have said stomach, you have said duodenum, or more commonly, first part of duodenum. Where else? You have to think, where else do you get ectopic gastric mucosa? So that will be your answer. So where else do you get it? Do, do you get any OG junction? Yes. Esophagogastric junction, right? So that is where also you get uh, pepsin secreting cells. Jyoti has said that you can get it in a Meckel's diverticulum as well. So yes, all Meckel's diverticulum or Meckel's diverticulum with gastric, gastric mucosa. Not all Meckel's diverticulum. Where else? Anywhere else? Just one more. So if I say five, it is stomach, duodenum, OJ, Meckel's and one more. And patient had undergone earlier surgery for Yeah. Jyoti has answered. Stomal ulcer. Stomal ulcer, right? If you've done a gastrojejunostomy previously, you may have uh, similar ulcers in the region of the gastrojejunal stoma. Okay, so five points stomach, duodenum, OJ, uh, esophageal uh, OG, uh, Meckel's diverticulum, and uh, gastrojejunostomy stoma. Okay, so name one common organism which may be responsible. There are multiple factors where uh, leading to a gastric ulcer. Main right. one organism which may be responsible for the uh, formation of a gastric ulcer. Helicobacter pylori. Helicobacter pylori. Okay. Now, <clears throat> why are these ulcers, we said they are more common along the lesser curvature. That's what we said right at the beginning. Why are they so common near the lesser curvature? Ma'am, due to the cells are more concentrated. Yes, Yeah. I didn't get you. Come again. What did you say? We said more cells in the lesser curvature. 
It's not true. Yes. You do have the responsible cells located more in the region of the lesser curvature. And secondly, when the food is taken in, that passes more frequently through along a part called, what is it called? What is that straight called? It is called the Magenstros. Okay, so the food travels more along the lesser curvature and also pepsin and acid secreting cells are more present along the lesser curvature. Hence, this is more prone to developing ulcers. Okay, fine. Okay, so is there any chance of this ulcer uh, undergoing malignant changes? Yes, ma'am. Yes? Yes, ma'am. It can undergo malignant changes. What about a peptic ulcer in the duodenum, in the meckles, all the other places that we talked about? Particularly in the duodenum? They are also prone to undergo malignancy, but they are more prone to bleed compared to malignancy. But the main thing is, in duodenal ulcers, the chances of conversion to malignancy is very, very low close to nil. But a gastric ulcer, yes, a chronic gastric ulcer may uh, convert to malignancy, even though even here also the percentage is not very high, but it is much more than the dual. How will name two features by which this present, if this patient might present to you clinically, two clinical features by which this patient may present to you. Ma'am, abdominal pain. Okay, let me rephrase my sentence. Two features by which this patient may present to you in the emergency. Emergency, uh, maybe like a upper GI bleeding or obstruction. GI <coughs> bleeding or obstruction. Why does the upper GI bleeding occur? Or rather, what is the source of the upper GI bleed in an ulcer like this? Usually left gastric artery. Left yes, gastric. so it left, right gastric, left gastric artery. So in the stomach, it is left gastric artery. In case of duodenum, it is posterior duodenal artery. But come again. Tell me again. I didn't hear you. The most common cause of gastric ulcer bleed is uh, left gastric artery. In case of duodenal ulcer bleed, it is gastric Where is the left gastric artery? Left gastric artery. It's entered in the OG junction. Left gastric artery will not come in relation to the antrum, isn't it? So, what is the artery which comes in relation to the posterior surface of the stomach near the antrum? Think about it. So, if there is an ulcer which erodes into that vessel, that causes torrential bleed. Posterior what is the posterior duodenal artery? Posterior duodenal artery. I didn't know there was such an artery. Gastroduodenal artery. Gastro. Yes. So, it is the gastroduodenal artery which lies in relation to the posterior wall of the stomach. So usually the ulcer is in the posterior wall of the stomach. So when it erodes through the posterior wall, it might lead to torrential bleeds. Yes, so that is one emergency presentation. What other emergency presentation can you have? Chronic uh, gastric ulcer leading to gastric outlet obstruction. Chronic gastric ulcer leading to? Gastric outlet obstruction. Emergency. Gastric. Emergency. Patient might require emergency surgical intervention. If there is so much acid pouring into the space, can anything else happen to the ulcer? Per One, it is my yes. Perforation. Perforation, exactly. So you can have an emergency bleed. You can have an emergency perforation. Okay. So these are the two cases where you will immediately have to enter. A gastric outlet obstruction will give you some time to resuscitate the patient, evaluate the patient. But these are the two scenarios in which. Fair enough. Uh, other than these two emergency procedures and gastric outlet, which might subsequently lead to uh, surgical intervention, most of the other complications of a gastric ulcer can be treated by medical means. Right? Now, this ulcer, the next one that I showed you. Yeah. So, this you said could be a, a malignant ulcer. Right? Mm -hmm. So, which part of the stomach uh, is more prone to uh, malignancy? A malignant ulcer. Distal one third of the stomach. Distal? Distal one third of the stomach more common. Again, the pylorus antrum and the pyloric region. Right. What about the what next? What next? Which other part comes next? Lesser. So you move proximally. Maximum is the pyloric region, the antrum. Next, you have the body, and then you move on to the cardia. Okay. Now, if this patient is there. What could be the presentation of this patient? 
what could be the clinical presentation of this patient mam uh, asymptomatic anemia mass melina that is not asymptomatic these are non specific symptoms non specific vague symptoms. vague symptoms it could be for any reasons not just stomach but specific to the stomach what may be the presentations mam post prandial abdominal pain that could be a with gastric ulcer also a benign gastric ulcer also okay what else there are distinct groups of patient the classical description of the groups of patient presenting with c stomach one you said is 3a next mm -hmm. anemia asthenia anorexia the three a's okay, and then it can again be a bleed yes, okay it can again be an outlet obstruction yes, okay it can be present as a lump abdomen it can be as a palpable lump and it can be pre presence of gastric outlet obstruction as i said so you have the same types only so if the patient comes to you with these symptoms clinically and it the, is very and the other and the other group is metastatic group yes with oh, patient come with ascites patient can come with a left cervical lymph node okay or a enlarged liver so another is a metastatic group okay so if the in, in these patients be it a benign ulcer or a malignant ulcer i will allow you to do only two investigations if i allow you to do only two investigations what are the two investigations that you are going to do endoscopic biopsy in be more specific what endoscope are you talking about so upper gi okay, endoscopy with the biopsy yes you have to be very specific with your answers right okay endoscopy and biopsy and cct whole abdomen cct whole abdomen with again be specific with oral and iv contrast that completes your answer so cct abdomen with oral and iv contrast and a upper gi endoscopy, endoscopy. fair enough now when you do a cct whole abdomen with oral and iv contrast what are the things that you look for in the ct scan remember very, very basic questions you are reading a ct regularly so what are the things that you look for five things right of the origin of the ulcer yes is... yes so first the organ of origin with that it is the stomach number one number two Side size, shape of the ulcer, then surrounding structures involved. Can be no side size shape. CT scan. I'm talking about CT scan. Don't say that is what that is generally for all ulcers. But yes, yeah, specifically in the CT scan, you are given a plate of a CT scan in a patient of CA stomach. What are the things that you are going to look for? So it's for what? It's for staging. Yes, so in what first going for the side and the involvement of the surrounding organs are not any fluid uh, fluid collection in the abdomen surrounding lymph nodes. Okay, so just let's go systematically. Number one, organ of origin that it is the stomach. Number number two is depth of the invasion, but depth is better assessed by an US, not so much by the CT scan. Whether it is in the submucosa, serosa, whatever. Number three, infiltration into surrounding organs. whether it is going into the pancreas or now into the duodenum or into the liver wherever okay number 4 any surrounding adjacent draining lymph nodes yeah right and number 5 any evidence of distant metastasis it could be liver yeah. mates it could be ascites it could be peritoneal nodules but is peritoneal nodules easily picked up by ct scan usually not picked up by the ct scan Why not five. remember The CT is less sensitive to nodules, which are usually less than five. It is not less sensitive if you take smaller cuts, because we usually take five millimeter cuts. Five millimeter cuts may often miss a peritoneal nodule. So if you take two three millimeter cuts, you will get it. So it is less sensitive because of the cuts that you take. So five points you should know when you are doing a CT scan. Fair enough. So you have done a CT. You are not sure. You do not have any US facility in your center. so you are not sure about the depth of invasion whether there is serosal disease or not any other investigation which is actually a procedure would you like to do before putting the patient for surgery diagnostic laparoscopy diagnostic laparoscopy okay so you have done you have put in the scope you see that the there is no ascites liver is free uh, some peritoneal uh, no peritoneal deposits uh, 
uh, and you go to the stomach and you see evidence of serosal deposit with mild fixity to the pancreas. What will be your next plan of management? Just give me the headings. I don't want detail. Um, only to the pancreas means I will try to yes, There is serosal disease. There is serosal disease with infiltration into pancreas. Serosal um, nodules can be seen. Uh, what are your options for treatment? Ma'am, uh, neoadjuvant followed by surgery is resectability. Yes, yes, yes. If you have a locally advanced disease, you will go for neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then reassess the patient and then proceed for surgery. Fair enough. Okay. What are the methods by which a CA stomach can spread? Ma'am, uh, direct the involvement spread, to the nearby yes. organs. Then by means of lymphatic spread, then the through hematogenous route. Just a minute, just a minute. First one, what did you say? I didn't get you. Direct Spring involvement in the nearby organs. Okay, so maybe stomach infiltrating into pancreas. So direct spread. Okay, next. Lymphatic spread. Okay, lymphatic spread goes into the lymph nodes. Right. Hematogenous. Hematogenous. Where can it go? From lungs. Yeah. Lung, liver, brain. Lung, liver, brain. Okay, number four. Silomic spread, transilomic spread. Trans? Silomic spread. Silomic spread. Okay, or the trans. Okay, and where can it go by the silomic spread? Will you call it silomic or transperitoneal? Transperitoneal. Transperitoneal. And where can it go? Mm. What is pouch of Douglas. Nodes in the pouch of Douglas. Douglas. And in in females, what tumors do we get in the pelvis following a, a pouch or spread it through the deposit in Brookenburg. the pouch? Brukenberg tumor. Correct. Brukenberg tumor. Any other? As you said, it could be transluminal also. That means passing through the lumen. So, number one, direct, then lymphatic, then bony, then transperitoneal, and you can have transluminal. Any tumor markers you would like to do for a case of CA stomach? CA 72-4. CA 19. CA, CA 99, these are the common ones. Yes, 72.4 is considered sensitive, but may or may not be available in all centers. Commonly, what we do is CA and CA 99. Okay. Now, um, let's take a look at um, this image. Take a look at this image as a continuity of our discussion. What do you how see? How is the stomach wall? How is the stomach wall? Yes. So this is stomach so again. Thickened. But look at the wall in particular. It is thickened. It is thickened. Correct. What do you think it is? Why is it thickened? And if you look closely, you'll find that there are white strands traversing along the wall of the stomach. And you see, called? in the mucosa, Mucosa may be a little flattened, but there is no obvious uh, per se. ulcer or lesion in the... Yeah, this see, is a better image. The white stents. You can make out the white stents traversing along the wall of the stomach. Yeah. You can see a very thickened wall and you can see the mucosa flattened. You In this case, there is an ulcer. In the previous one, there was no ulcer. Okay. But... The uniform, uniformly thickened wall is evident in both the specimens. What is this? Linite is plastic. Linite is plastic. In what percentage of cases of CA stomach do you get linite? Is it very common? Very rare. It is not very rare, but relatively less common. So it's about only 7% patients you have linite, 7% patients of um, CA stomach. What happens? Why do we get this appearance? Then it is diffuse spread. Yes, it is a diffuse spread. It, at which level? There so is a the, layers of the stomach. At which level do you have the diffuse spread? At which level do you have the diffuse spread? At the submucosal level. Mucosal. That is why you may have a flattening of the mucosa. Okay. And why do you have this thickened wall? So it infiltrates into all layers of the stomach, but it may spare the mucosa. 
so it infiltrates into all layers so that is why you have a uniformly thickened well yes you do get linitis localized linitis plastica also but that is localized near the anteral region mostly what we get is a uniformly thickened stomach there is a common uh, colloquial name for this type of stomach what is it called there is a common bottle. name leather bottle leather bottle stomach correct because it looks like a leather bottle which the travelers of the yester years used to carry okay so it looks like a leather bottle now if this is your patient what surgery would you advocate total gastrectomy you will have to do a total gastrectomy we can esophago jejunal yes. okay uh, sir shall we move to the next specimen uh, yeah just uh, one question if you in a benign ulcer if you make a section what are the two important uh, histological finding in benign ulcer what do you see under microscope in benign ulcer two important histological finding mm -hmm. one is what happens in the walls there is a there is a destruction of the mucosa and there is infiltration of Lymphosis. chronic inflammatory cells okay okay these are the two important finding in chronic gastric ulcer in malignancy what is the commonest type of malignancy in the stomach just one thing still can ha the commas sir common the stomach no carcinoma adenocarcinoma adenocarcinoma yeah and then you should read there are a lot of other variants of carcinoma which can occur in the stomach histological variants yes. okay Fine. You can proceed the next yes. We, you will also Thank need you. to know the classifications of different classifications that are used, so yes, because yes. you don't know where your examiner might pull you with a specimen. Okay, so you need to know your classification, clinical yes. presentations, imaging findings, operative options, classifications, and as Sir said, histopathological variations. All these things you have to read up. Okay, we'll move to the next one. Who is our next volunteer? Thank you, Mr. Deepak. Uh, Is there anybody uh, among the participants who would like to volunteer? Otherwise, I'll ask one of those. I can see Dr. Deepak Sahu. Would he like to come in? Hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Deepak, this is your specimen. Can you identify what the problem is? Or can you just uh, read the specimen? What can you see? Ma'am, this is a Meckel's diverticulum. You think this describe. is a Meckel? Why do you call it the Meckel's diverticulum? Describe the describe the finding. Finding. Don't jump. Okay, because okay. Why do you say so? Describe what you see. Uh, ma'am, I am seeing uh, um, a, one diverticulum along the anti-mesenteric border of uh, yeah uh, small intestine. First thing is identify the parent organ. So these yeah. are this is a loop of small gut. Okay, yeah, that's the first small. thing I would like to hear. and you have to tell me why you think this is the small gut from the outer appearance why you think this is a small gut there are uh, no hostra no hostrations okay what else three points i would like to hear very specific what else is not there it is basically a matter of elimination okay so no hostrations what else no tinea no tinea no absence of appendices epiploecy and yes, only insertion yes, of mesentery okay right Yes, ma'am. So, if these three were present, it would make it into a, a large gut. Yes, so, this is small gut, and you yes, said that there is a diverticulum arising from the diverticulum uh, arising from where? Ileum. So, you think this is small gut and diverticulum arising from the anti-mesenteric border? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Now, why did you say it is Meckel's? By looking at this image, can you say it is a Meckel's? Mm, it is actually from IC junction. Actually, IC junction is not visible. Not visible. Exactly. See, Meckel's is a specific type of diverticulum arising from the terminal part of the eye. So, if your IC junction is visible, then you can say it is Meckel's. Otherwise, it is, it is a diverticulum arising from the anti-mesenteric border of the small intestine. That is going to be a, a safer answer. Okay. Do not commit to a Meckel's right away. okay so when you say there is a diverticulum and i and you said it was a meckels how would you define a meckels what are the characteristics what 
What are the characteristics? Uh, you there are some, not, something related to two. Yes, many many really? things come from two. Ah, yes, yes, sir. Um, this is uh, um, from two feet from uh, within two feet from Ice Johnson. Yes. Uh, uh, then length is it's present in two uh, two percent of population. Very good. Uh, then it's um uh, two inch in length. Yes. Hey, how are you? Sir? So it is present in two percent of the population, about two inches long. And may be present within the terminal two feet of two the. Feet of the ICG. ICG. Okay. Now there are two terms that we commonly use. That is a true diverticulum and a pseudo diverticulum or a false diverticulum. What is the difference between these two? What uh, is the difference? If yeah. all the all the layers uh, of the uh, gut is present, then it is true. Or uh, if uh, only uh, single layer is present, uh, then it is false diverticulum. Right. So don't say single layer. Say all layers are not present. Yes. Okay, and the size is it from the mesentery border, anti mesentery border? Anti anti mesentery border. No, acquired diverticulum. Acquired diverticulum. Just mesentery. No, no, sir. The where is the weakest part in the gut wall? Uh, the blood vessels were entering. Yes. Yes, so, so it is a mesentric border. Mesentric yeah. border. So the acquired diverticulum occurs more in the mesentric border. Mesentric border. It can come in the anterior border, but more commonly it is in the mesentric border because which case is there as the vessel entering to the gut wall. Vessel entering there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what is what? How does a Meckel's diverticulum form? You we said it is a congenital structure. So how does it form? Is it a remnant of any congenital structure? Um, vital intestinal duct. It is a remnant of the vital intestinal duct. So what happens in this case, you and me, the vital intestinal duct disappears. So in this patient, what happened? Um, um, distal part disappeared, but proximal part, uh, it stayed. Okay. okay. Yeah. Now, how do you think this patient will present to you? <coughs> what maybe, are the presentation? Maybe this patient, sir, uh, asymptomatic. And yeah. some patient may present with uh, uh, hemorrhage. Or intersusception. So in these, uh, what's it? I'll just stop you. In these asymptomatic patients, how do you know that there is a mechanism? If uh, if I am uh, doing operation for any uh, other procedure, that that's when I can see. So, yeah, so it's an incidental, incidental finding. Incidental finding. Any other surgery. Incidental yes. finding during any other surgery. Oh, yes. So that is number one. Number two. Um, a hemorrhage, obstruction. Okay, where else? What uh, else? Obstruction, perforation, uh, intersusception. Okay. Obstruction, why does it obstruct? <laughs> See, it, you said that it is the proximal part of the uh, vital intestinal duct which has not resolved. If the distal part has become like a band, it can mm -hmm. turn off. Yeah, there if there is a band, there may be band addition. Bands and addition. There can also be intersusception of the same um, uh, medicals. Yes, yes. Do you know what is a litter's hernia? Uh, Ma'am, uh, uh, litter's hernia, uh, it is presence of Meckel's diverticulum uh, in uh, hernial sac as content. Right, right. It's a Meckel's present in the hernial sac. That is called litter's hernia. Okay, fine. So you said that these patients can present with vomiting, uh, pain abdomen and bleeding. Where does this bleeding occur from? Uh, bleeding. If you correlate it with our previous specimen. Okay. Why Michael Javerical can bleed? Yes. If there is any uh, um, gastric mucosa present there and uh, that so ulcer, 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 so ulcer, 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 ulcer may bleed. So it will cause peptic ulcer and then the peptic ulcer may bleed. So if the patient is symptomatic, you are not getting your routine investigations are not revealing anything. Is there any one particular investigation which might lead to your diagnosis of a Meckel's diverticulum? 
first Dr. Jyoti to please join if she can. Ma'am, Dr. Jyoti is here. Dr. Jyoti, yes, Jyoti. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, Jyoti. Uh, Jyoti, this is your specimen. Uh, can you read this, uh, what you see? Madam, segment of bubble dilated uh, um, small bubble. And small gut, what else? And this dilated, dilated small gut also, or the area of sickle junction. What, what, what else do you see? It is very, very obvious. I agree there is a dilated segment of small gut, but what else do you see? Yes. yes. Give, a, give a classic description. I would say this is telescoping. Telescoping. Yes. See, this part seems to have entered this part, right? So yes. there is telescoping of the proximal part of the small gut into a distal part of small gut, right? Are you yes. sure both are small gut? We just discussed in the previous specimen. Yes, how you because like uh, features of... Uh, yes. So then what would be your diagnosis? Intersusception. Ileal intersusception. Ileal intersusception. Fine. So when I use the word in intersusception, it means that there is invagination or telescoping of a proximal okay. segment of the gut into another adjacent gut. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So there are some parts of the intersusception. Yes. When you classically yes. describe it, what are they? Intersuscipients, intersusceptum, apex, lead point, and neck of the and neck, neck, neck of yeah. So is a lead point present in all patients no, of susceptibility? No, ma'am. No, ma then where are they present? Madam, lead point like in other maximum adults, we will see the lead point, madam. In children, it's, uh, usually it's around. Lead point. Oh. Yeah, sorry. sorry, go ahead. In in a children, a winning time, we, usually we won't have. Leading point. I mean, adults like like polyp, I don't know, I don't know, malipoma, like things. So you get a lead point. Okay. In, in infants, you have some lead point, but that is yeah, not a distinct tumor. Lead point in a child. Hypertrophic pear patches. Yes. Pear patches. Right. So don't make a blanket statement. Say in most children, ninety percent of children, a lead point may or may not be present. Okay. Whereas in ninety percent adults, a lead point is usually present. Right. And you have to be very cautious in adults because these lead points, not necessarily it will be just lipoma and polyp, it may be malignant. malignant. Okay. So, uh, I mean, uh, this patient, how will they usually present? Usually present as an uh, uh, obstruction case. Obstruction. Okay. And what else? If it is a... So, clinically, when you are examining, the patient comes with features of obstruction. Yes. Yes. Are there any typical clinical features you might elicit in a case of intersusception? Let's, let's say a child, a small child has come around nine months old. Usually, the child will be uh, during the episode of intersusception, child will be like uh, uh, pain, cries with pain, and otherwise, patient will, uh, child will be normal. Mother mm -hmm. explains like that, mom. and the child may have this uh, stool symptoms like red current jelly symptom. Okay. The what about the abdominal examination? What does it mean? It may be it usually empty um, uh, on the left side of the umbilicus concave shape mass can be felt by mother. On the right side of the abdomen, it can be empty mass because of uh, hypertrophy of the pear patches usually. No, it's not hypertrophy, mind you. It yes. is basically because that gut has telescoped into the adjacent gut. Okay. So that is why it is empty. It's not that there is hypertrophy or atrophy. Okay. So you might get a sausage-shaped uh, mass it's into the umbilicus with a concavity towards the umbilicus and the right ilia may be empty. What is this called? There is a sign. Dance. Dance sign or sign. Sign D dance. Okay. Um, just look at this aspect, um, image. See, this was a patient and when we opened the uh, specimen, this is the lead point that we were talking about. You might also get a specimen like this. They have cut open the specimen and you can appreciate the in the invaginating tube as well as the lead point. 
So you may get a specimen of fresh specimen or a preserved specimen like this also in your exam. Okay. Now, what do you understand by a compound intersusception? And by compound intersusception. So in intersusception, as you said, is a process mm -hmm. usually an imagination or telescoping of one proximal part of the gut into the distal gut. Mm -hmm. A compound intersusception is when one intersusception invaginates into yet another distal part. So you may be having an ileo-ileal intersusception, and this whole thing as a whole might again intersusept into uh, the distal mode part. So where you have two or more intersusceptions occurring, one into the other, that is called a compound intersusception. But you have to identify it from another term called multiple intersusception, where you might have distinct two or more intersusceptions in different parts of the gut. Did you get it? Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Now, if this patient comes to you, our previous patient, how would you manage the patient? Uh, before that, before that, uh, the smell going into the distal. Can you give an example where the distal is intersusceptible? Any condition in the abdomen? The distal intersusceptible into the proximal. Any example? This is jejunogastric intersusception. Following GJ, jejunogastric intersusception. Okay, so that is the situation where the distal is going into the proximal part. Okay, presentation. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about treatment. Presentation, she's already yeah. said. Yeah. Uh, treatment. treatment. Yeah. What will be your plan of treatment? Presentation present with the uh, like acute signs of a, a small obstruction. We go for a reduction. I mean, surgical procedure. I mean, acute case. I didn't understand. It's an and acute if case. Present, if patient present as acute. Uh, to obstruction. confirm the diagnosis, it's, it's, it does sometimes diagnosis is not confirmed in all situations. You need to confirm the diagnosis and then proceed. You have one patient admitted in Bagayuti now. This patient, I have not gone for emergency surgery. He is having symptoms for last one week. He is managing. So you need to do some... What investigation will start with? Madam, uh, CT abdomen. Mark. Yeah. What? You, you can do a CT abdomen, yes. Uh, something a little older version of that, which can be done. In, 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 in diagnostic and therapeutic process also. Yes. What is it? Diagnostic as may serve the purpose as a therapeutic also. And in, in, so not uh, very commonly done now. In, 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 in. It could be a barium minima. Yes, because if you give the enema under high pressure, it might uh, you reduction. know reduce the perception. Yeah. This is applicable seeking, for. Ileocecocolic, ileocecocolic intersusception, that is the invasion of choice. If you have a diagnosis of jejunojejunal or jejunoileal, then this may not help. Okay. Yes. If you have it, because in, in infants, this is an invasion and treatment in infants where the ileocecocolic is more common. If you okay. do a CT scan, like you said, what is that sign that you see? It is, there is a typical sign. Which is, sign. It is called the claw sign. Yes. yes. So you see one in, encroaching into the invaginate into the proximal part, and it the proximal part actually looks like a claw. Okay. If you're um, obviously it's an adult patient who has presented with acute abdomen, and you go in and see, you've done a laparotomy, you've gone in and seen that there is an acute intersusception. What will be your further uh, thoughts of treatment? First, if uh, I will try to reduce, I mean, uh, reduce the intersusception. Uh, How will you reduce it? How by will you reduce it? By milking the distal part. Uh, sir, distal part. Yes, distal part has to be. You never pull it out. You yes, push, it from, push it from the distal part. But so suppose five. you see that there is already compromised vascularity. Then will you attempt go. reduction? No, ma'am. Uh, if vascularity is compromised, bowel is stimulated. 
better to do for a, it will better to better go to for a resection ma'am resection ma'am so yeah. otherwise if you see bowel is healthy you will try to reduce it by squeezing the distal part and not pulling out the proximal part correct okay fine and sometimes you get a lot of additions between the proximal and the distal part the gut, gut apparently looks healthy okay and you are not being able to milk it out because there is an addition between the invaginating part and the part receiving intersuscipients and the intersusceptible is there any technique by which you can overcome this madam we can uh, try to reduce the adhesion or uh, try to release adhesions with uh, high plant dissection and if then we will check for all the copes technique copes cop copes technique where you can insert your finger between the intersusceptible and the suscipients break the additions and then again squeeze from distal part to reduce the intersusception so it's called the copes technique okay. yeah uh, only 15 minutes shall we move to the next yeah. specimen yes please one more okay. specimen 10 10 yeah. minutes more yeah okay um somebody else please uh, yes um, uh, dr soman is there uh, dr soman can you please uh, unmute hello good morning ma'am good morning soman uh, soman this is your specimen uh, can you read it please this is a part uh, open specimen of uh, small yes, gut small gut yes showing multiple uh, by looking at this image why do you say small gut because we are not being able to see the back side so we do not know whether there is tinea or not whether there is hostration or not appendicitis epiplosy but looking at this part can you see it is small gut the mucosal pattern yes the mucosal pattern is a characterless mucosal pattern which is distinctly different from a colonic mucosal pattern right so yes this is a small gut yes what else do you see <clears throat> multiple polypoidal structure over uh... okay what else polypoidal um, structure would you call it polypoidal small gut you said remember okay given that you think it is a polypoidal structures multiple polypoidal structures uh, what could be the diagnosis so you think that this is the small gut these are the normal mucosa and here you said there are multiple polypoidal structures right so what could be your diagnosis yes anybody else the normal mucosa cells are not seen there replaced by one inflamed that one yes uh, dr nikhil uh, has said that it could be crohns dr nikhil can you say why you think it is crohns and if it is crohns what are these polypoidal structures that shuman is talking about uh, good morning ma'am yes nikhil you said it uh, is crohns be, yeah this can be crohns ma'am because we can see the normal mucosal part and abnormal mucosal part which can be due to some inflammation yeah so uh, classically it can be said that this this segment shows the skip lesions uh, uh, healthy mucosa and unhealthy just, mucosa. Hold, on, hold on hold on skip lesions means that you have a segment with this lesion then there is a healthy segment and then you have another part i am saying that he uh, dr shuman said that these are polypoidal lesions and you said this is crohns now do we get polypoidal lesions in crohns or do we get polypoidal lesions in some other inflammatory bowel disease polypoidal lesions we can get in uh, uh, ulcerative colitis yes and ulcerative colitis is in more common in which part of the gut that is in large large gut so it is mainly colon and rectum right so he right at the beginning he said this is a small gut very correctly he said this is a small gut so if it is a small gut crohns is more common crohns in fact can be present in which part of the gi system 
I mean, can present in from uh, oral cavity to anus anywhere? Yes, so it can be present anywhere, but ulcerative colitis is more commonly restricted to colon and rectum. Okay, so if it is small gut, I would like to think. So now, if you can rephrase it, will you call it polyps or will you call this anything else? I would like to call it the cobblestone appearance. Okay, so these are not polyps. This is because of the edematous mucosa in between. If there are two ulcers, the mucosa in between becomes edematous and raised, giving rise to this cobblestone appearance. Okay. So if you are talking about... Shumon, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Shumon, coming back to you, uh, you see if, if we think it is Crohn's, basically what is the pathology? What happens in Crohn's? Is it confined to the mucosa or it is a transmural inflammation? What is the it's a pathology? it's a transmural inflammation. So it involves all the layers. You will have deep mucosal ulcerations with transmural spread. And if you look externally, you may get a creeping mesenteric fat around the bowel. If it, it's an intraoperatic finding, we usually find a creeping fat around the bowel. And the whole wall itself becomes fibrotic and thickened. Right? So you have a thickened wall. You have a narrow lumen. You will have deep ulcerations, transmural infiltration and creeping of the fat. Okay? So it involves all layers. And very correctly, either you or Nikhil, one of you said that there may be skip lesions. So it is not a continuous ulcerative colitis as opposed to that may not have skip lesions. It is usually uh, continuous. Right? Fine. So, in a patient of Crohn's disease, what are the modes of presentation? How do they present? Okay. Do you generally have acute presentations or more of a chronic presentation? A chronic presentation, from complaints of pain, regular pain. Yes. What else? <coughs> What else with pain? If you what, have happens such to, what happens to this inflammation resulting in? There may be uh, hemorrhage uh, manifested no. by hematocytia. So that they present with chronic diarrhea. Diarrhea. Uh -huh. Diarrhea. They are chronic diarrhea. And then they may present with other complications. Yes. So typically they may present with pain abdomen more in the right iliac fossa because Crohn's is most commonly present in the terminal ileum, though it may be, as you correctly said, present anyway. They will have diarrhea with colicky pain. Again, they may have anemia, weight loss and all that because a lot of protein is lost in these patients. And these patients, when they have repeated inflammation, it might lead to fibrosis and obstruction. That is when the patient might come to you. Okay, otherwise, usually in the chronic phase, they are treated by a gastroenterologist. Can you have uh, any other place other than the, you said it can be from anywhere from mouth to anus. Can you have any extra GI presentation of Crohn's? Extra intestine. Yes, yes. <clears throat> what can you have? Some uh, uh, some uh, bony presentation, uh, bone related presentation, arthral GI. Try to and arthropathy. Arthropathy. Yes. Any skin lesion? Any skin lesion? Skin changes. Uh, uh, bioderma, gangrenosum. Very good. And erythema nodosum. Two of them. Yeah. Anything in the eyes? Yes. Uh, eye presentation will also be there. Uh, so you can have uveitis. Iritis, right? Sorry, ma'am, so it's it not coming to my mind. It will be arthropathy, yeah, skin changes, and eye changes. Okay. And though not strictly extra intestinal, you can also have perianal abscesses, ulcers, which are basically a complication of the Crohn's disease in the lower GI tract. If you were to investigate this patient, what in, if the patient has come to you with these symptoms, what investigation protocol will you follow? Uh, before that, any some part of the uh, uh, histology. Uh, what is the difference between Crohn's and tuberculosis? Because they are two diseases very common. Yes. How do you differentiate 
Crohn's from tuberculosis. Clinically, it is difficult. You see, yes. if the patient has got a stenosing lesion, obstruction you cannot make out from clinical examinations, tuberculosis or Crohn's. But histologically, there is some uh, difference. See, they are all, both chronic diseases, so they will have manifestation of chronic disease like lymphoid aggregation, granulomas. But tuberculosis and Crohn's, there is one distinct difference in the nature of the granuloma. That will be a giveaway. What is a yeah. typical granuloma or in tuberculosis? That is caseating granuloma. Caseating granuloma. And in Crohn's, non caseating granuloma? Non caseating. Yeah. So you were sorry, I kept one step. You were talking about chronic symptoms. If when does it present to a surgeon? Acute symptoms. How does it present? Uh, it's normally a chronic disease. So it can be acute inflammation, limiting them appendicitis. Yes, acute inflammation. There can be perforation. There can be features of peritonitis, obstruction. obstruction because of stricture formation. So these are the acute presentations when you or I can get a patient of Crohn's. And, and but, internal fistulization. Internal yes. fistulization. You can in fact have an entrocutaneous fistula also, presenting to you as an entrocutaneous fistula also. Okay. So we were talking about investigation. How would you yes. like to investigate these patients? <clears throat> Yes. In 2021, if you were to investigate this patient, what are the two basic investigations that you will do? Yes. Endoscopic evaluation. Endoscopic. Colonoscopic. So colonoscopic evaluation. Yes, colonoscopic. But yes, if it was a small gut, a colonoscopy would be difficult to um, find a diagnosis. But whenever you're doing the scopy, uh, what are the things that you will see in a scopy, typically in a scopy? You will see evidence of inflammation. There will be areas of normal mucosa in between, like in our image. There may be some ulcers. There can be a stricture. And the cobblestone mucosa that you can see in our image here, you can see that as well. Okay. Now, we used to, in our uh, residency days also, we used to do an X-ray sometimes. Okay. So, if we do an X-ray, what is the typical finding called? X-ray in case of a Crohn's disease, there are there are some typical findings which you get in an X-ray plate in your exam also. Right? This is there is something called a rose thorn appearance. A rose thorn appearance. Yes, yes, rose thorn. Right. Because see, when you are doing a barium uh, study, then because there are deep mucosal ulcers, those are the areas where the dye stays back. And later, if you take an image, it looks like a rose thumb. Or there is something called like string sign of cantor. String sign of cantor. Cantor. Yeah, because of the fibrosis, there is narrowing of the lumen. So you get a long, narrow lumen with a dilated part proximally and distally because of these healthy parts in between. So that can be a string sign of cantor. What could be the complications of this case? How, how, how can you visualize the small gut? You see, upper G endoscopy, lower G endoscopy cannot see the small gut. What is the modern investigation for visualization of the whole of the small gut? Sir, uh, CT enterography or um, yes. MRI enterography. What else? More direct what visualization. Is, is something like a camera inside your capsule, small gut? Capsule. Capsule endoscopy. And, capsule and, and now we have the facility for that also, apart from capsule. These are known as double balloon enteroscopy. Oh, double balloon, yes. Sir. Okay, so if you, if you take your scope into the small gut and you can see up to almost the terminal ileum. So these are the newer investigation to visualize the small gut. Either a capsule endoscopy or double balloon enteroscopy. Okay. So, if the patient presents to you in the surgical OPD with one of the complications of the management will be quite obvious. But before that, the patients are usually on medical management. So, what are the, can you name five drugs which are commonly used for medical management of Crohn's disease? What is the most commonly used drug? Sir, so, uh, 
उंडिंग एरिया so uh, a small course of antibiotic might help most importantly you have to give a lot of nutritional support there is gross protein loss and the patients become nutritionally very very compromised only when they are uh, they move on to the acute phase uh, acute phase meaning complications and they visit our uh, surgical department um, sir uh, shall okay. we stop or yes 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 9:36 you can stop <coughs> okay take another one or, one or two more classes Huh? Yeah, very okay. nice. Because you see, in OSCE now, yes. still the next question also that it will be an OSCE pattern. So we have discussed little more, but you will be given just scenario. Identify the parent organ, name two uh, findings, give two histological features. Okay, name two drugs used. So we have discussed little more, but in OSCE you will get a specific questions, and the answer should be very specific because the marks are related like that. Huh? Okay, thank you, Dr. Shamita. We have a very nice uh, discussion for this uh, few specimen. We will repeat sometime later. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so this is the last class for us in the. Oh no, tomorrow we have a class. Sorry. Day after. Yeah. Day after. Thirty first, eh? Uh, sir, thirtieth. Thirtieth uh, faculty lecture. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.